Hello, everyone. Um, to start us off, we have interpretation available in Spanish. You can click the bottom of your screen, the globe icon, to access interpretation in Spanish. We have the wonderful Tanya and Elena with us today as interpreters. I'll give everyone a second to switch if they would like to. Right. It's so lovely to have all of you with us today. Um, this is the fourth webinar in our series, um, The Power of Feminist Narratives from Fragmentation to Solidarity. My name is Vandita and I'm the moderator of this webinar series put together by the fabulous Heinrich Pohl team. Last Tuesday, we held a webinar on the power of feminist research in understanding implications in shaping public discourse with Evrin and Shams. It was an important and insightful conversation and it left me with a lot of learning on how do we bring our feminist praxis and our politics together in our everyday life. Our theme for today is the power of feminist teaching and how it can be used to overcome binary narratives. The positioning of feminist academics in academia is of crucial importance, especially since the rise of authoritarianism has legitimized and normalized misogynistic, homophobic, sexist, transphobic, and racist discourse. Even in public institutions and academia, just like when Hungary banned gender studies programs, claiming that they were a dangerous ideology. Today's webinar will aim to unpack some of this and perhaps go a little bit into some of the larger questions around this issue. Starting with, where does our understanding of feminism come from? Do we merely refer to the liberal feminism shaped in the global North and West? And what role does our collective experience rooted in different contexts of the world, play in feminist teaching. In particular, what is it that we can learn from feminist movements in global South countries and Southeastern Europe? In addition to this, how do we teach diverse feminist schools of thoughts in academia, despite being influenced by a certain type of mainstream feminism? Alongside this, we also look at what kind of language would we need to use for better acceptance of gender studies, feminist studies, and also thus avoiding a misuse of authoritarian regimes. We discuss these and other questions with our esteemed and very experienced feminist academic with us today. I'm going to give you a second to spotlight them. I'm very honored to introduce you to our panelists for the day. We have with us Agnieszka Graf. She's a Polish, uh, Polish scholar, feminist activist and public intellectual. She teaches at the American Studies Center, University of Warsaw. Her most recent book is Anti-Gender Politics in the Populist Moment, co-authored by Els Beata uh, Korolsko, uh, published by Rutledge. Unfortunately, our second panelist, Dr. Yalavi Clark, is unable to join us today. But before we start off, um, I want to share a small thing um, in my experience with Agnieszka. After my first one-on-one -on -one call with them, uh, the only question I asked them is, are there classes of yours that I can attend? And is there a way that I can learn from it? Uh, because that 30 minute conversation was so insightful for me. So I can't tell you how excited I am to have them with us for today's webinar. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm really sorry the other panelist um, is not with us. I've actually read um, uh, her article uh, in preparation, which I thought was really uh, fascinating about binary identities um, in Africa. So maybe we can get um, together at some other um, point. Um, yeah, the conversation was really fun for me as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there, there is a class you can attend by, not by me, but by my students, which maybe we can talk about that interview that was recorded and that I consider my greatest teaching achievement. Anyway, let's, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, before we start off, I just wanted to share some housekeeping information. Um, I request that you rename yourself with your name and your pronouns if you feel comfortable doing so. Just a small reminder that interpretation is available in Spanish. Um, we will also have some time both at the end and throughout for questions. So please use the chat to share your questions. If you feel uncomfortable sharing it with everybody, you can DM, you can direct message your question to me as well. We also have a community wall where you can engage with us throughout or even after the webinar. So I'm going to encourage all participants to start using the chat by sharing their name, pronouns, if comfortable, where you're joining us from. And we also thought we could ask you if there's a book you're reading off late that you'd like to share with us. While these responses come in, 
I'm going to start us off with my first question to you, uh, which is, it's, it's a simple question, I think. Uh, why should we talk about feminism in plural? Why is it important to understand different feminisms? It's actually a question I had to figure out for myself. Um, I used to teach a survey class called American Feminism. And about five or six years ago, I changed it um, to Faces of American Feminism. Uh, I wanted to make it feminisms, but uh, Polish um, uh, online systems are quite conservative and they thought that was a mistake. So um, I think we find ourselves ourselves in a in a historical moment when the plural internal plurality of feminism um has become inevitable it's what it's what you teach it's not what you teach around trying to 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 create a sense of um uh, oneness but rather it's the differences that i find um fascinating and they're both um uh, intellectual differences. In other words, I, I always insist on there being several uh, competitive traditions of feminist thought, which are sometimes antagonistic, sometimes in dialogue with each other, but it's, it's actually really useful to see that continuity of several divisions. And of course, I think since the 80s, which is when I became a feminist, something dramatic has happened with the assumption that there is such a thing as global feminism. One of the, the first books I, I, I got uh, in on my feminist bookshelf was the uh, Robin Morgan Sisterhood is Global Anthology. I think that would be an unthinkable title today. In fact, that whole moment in feminist history in the mid-80s is now viewed with a certain embarrassment um, as, as the last breath of that effort to make everyone, you know, sisters without examining the power imbalances, ideological differences, political differences that, that actually divide women as well as the various definitions of what it means to be a woman. Um, and yet I always start my classes with a minimum definition of feminism, which I'm happy to share with you. So I, I teach my students and we end up interrogating that definition eventually is that feminism is the ideology of the women's movement um, as well as the movement. In other words, the word has two meanings and those meanings are sometimes in conflict, as you mentioned, in the sense that praxis and theory um, are sometimes in tension with each other. And that to be a feminist is to uh, believe that that women um, are uh, treated worse than men that this is a political phenomenon and that it is unacceptable and everything beyond that is up for debate uh, including the definition of women of course so why are we treated unequally um how to change it um what is the role of capitalism in the history of of that inequality um what is the role of bodies what is the relationship of uh, that inequality uh, between these groups called men and groups for women and mm, uh, and racial or national identities. But the, the, the first impulse that I think um, must be named and that students find often a relief to name is that, well, that's what it is. It's, it's no, to be a feminist is to realize that what we are taught very often from early childhood to consider as natural difference is actually an injustice and inequality. And I think that insight is repeated by every generation of feminists. It takes different forms, but it's always, I think, there that the feminist aha takes place. So that's that's where I start. And then I show the divergent roots. Thank you. I love that. Um, I especially really like the part where you mentioned that you start with your students by giving them a simple definition and then getting them to question that itself. And that makes me think about like when I was, I've been both a student and a teacher in some ways. And when I was a student, I remember being told this is what the definition is. And it created a lot of discomfort for me because there were parts of it that I didn't align with. Or I felt like I needed to explore more to truly own that definition as well. And to get that space in a classroom is really beautiful. Um, so yeah, definitely. I definitely think there is no single feminism. And I'm going to ask the participants this question as well. Um, so the question is, do you believe multiple feminisms can coexist? I think they have coexisted uh, for, for many generations. 
Um, and uh, the question is whether we, we find ourselves in a situation where that coexistence is difficult around certain issues. And I think feminism today is at a crossroads or a, a difficult turn uh, concerning um, uh, the, the, tra the trans rights issue. And I, I think that that debate is, um, uh, or that antagonism can be understood variously. Um, some people see it as a betrayal. Um, if you are firmly located on one side, then you will see the other side as traitors and not really feminists. And to some extent, I share that view. Um, but if you step back and look at the genealogy of that debate, then you realize that actually the two positions are, uh, historically speaking, um, emergent from the distinction between um, uh, difference feminism and equality feminism, which runs very deep. Or to put it differently, um, in a more modern version, essentialism and constructionism. Uh, and that division has always been there. There is a wonderful essay that I very often teach uh, by Anne Snito, my uh, mentor, mm, unfortunately no longer with us. It's called Gender Diary. And she actually traces that division within her own life and within the literature, feminist literature of the of the 80s and 90s. And for me, that was a revelation. The fact that for, for many women, it's also an experiential thing. For some women to become a feminist is to is to realize that being a woman is a terrible, difficult thing painful thing and to feel, oh, if, oh, if only I were not born a woman. But for other women, to be a feminist is to be glad, to be relieved to be a woman and to dwell on womanhood. And so, so there is a kind of emotional investment in that. But feminists have always either challenged the uh, what what is defined as the biological difference between men and women uh, or um, insisted on it uh, while claiming that patriarchy denigrates the female side. And I think th those two cohorts have always existed. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually very troubled by the fact that the antagonism today is so deep and occasionally violent. Um, I'm, of course, I'm on, on one of the sides, but, but I also know the history. But there are other differences which can be equally um, uh, painful. One is about the relationship between feminism and capitalism. And I think that's clearly a dividing line that, mm, you know, that the younger, gen younger, young generation of feminists want to talk to. Uh, when I was um, in my most prolific years in the 90s, that divide was actually obfuscated by so-called post-feminism. And that the, the neoliberal feminism was so omnipresent that it actually took me some time to realize that I was breathing it. But now that divide is right in the center. Um, another divide has to do with religion. And depending on whether you live in a society that where secularism is a given or uh, completely off the table, you will live that division differently. Mm, and I've actually changed my position several times over, over religion. The, so, so there are power there, there are long lasting debates and i think uh, feminism does not exist as a single worldview it's not dogma it's not a sect in poland we like to say that uh, feminism is not a political party and does not have a central committee um which, you know which was the body that under communist times told uh, party members what to think so we don't have one you know you if you want to know what feminists think you have to ask a number of feminists and you'll get different answers yeah, thank you. I love that. I really enjoyed the reflexivity um, of your own experiences. And we actually already have questions coming in. So one of the questions that I think would be really great to ask at this point is, you mentioned when I became a feminist, and you also referred to people becoming feminists. Um, so participants would love to understand that, how does one become a feminist? And how do you teach or convey this message? I also want to uh, bring up something you shared with me in our conversation, which was, what is the goal of feminist teaching? And, you know, you mentioned that to become a feminist, you have to be able to do this as a free person with your own agenda. And I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit. Well, I became, um, I became a feminist in, in the, the most boring way possible. I read a book um, and that book was um, uh, Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own which I read with such uh, uh, such excitement and, and 
well, pain. And it was it was just an, a revel revelation for me that I ended up translating it into Polish. It was my first publication. I um uh, and it's actually still in print. It was reprinted recently. So apparently I'm um I, I did a good job. So so that was I was also a student at a university where there were lots of feminists, but I thought um, I went to the States to study. But actually, I made an effort to find out how women become feminists um, by asking um, a lot of them when I was writing my first book, World Without Women. And um, and a lot of them uh, gave me an answer, which is mm, out of reach for me because I'm a single child. I don't have brothers. Apparently, a lot of women become feminists uh, after being repeatedly told to clean up after their brothers. I heard a lot of stories about dirty socks and the expectation that the, the sister do the cleaning up. And I was recently at a, um, as a teacher, I guess, at the meeting in the Polish parliament with a lot of Polish high school students where this question was asked. And again, the dirty socks experience was was pretty vivid. Um, but I think it, it's a generational thing. There are generations of women in certain locations where you are almost born into feminism. That's what the so-called third wave in the 90s in the US was. One of the metaphors they had um, in this period was that feminism is like fluoride. You drink it with the water. That's how I found out they have fluoride in the water in the States. So there were daughters of feminists that were raised feminist, and then they had to define their own feminism in relationship to their mothers. But then there are generations, and I certainly was a member of such a generation in Poland, where mm, to be a feminist is to be marked as crazy, um, deviant, strange, unmarriageable, another thing, um, gay, uh, um, all sorts of things. And and to, to claim that identity is actually a huge step into an abyss and a, a, a dangerous and liberating experience. Um, and so I, I belong to a small cohort of women that did that in Poland in the 90s and, you know, went into the streets and overcoming the shame and the stigma and bonding with other women, making the, taking that risk. So I think it's it really varies. And I'm finding the, that a lot of my students today become feminists through participating in other movements. So they will be in, involved in uh, uh, you know, in queer uh, movements, in um, ecological movements, and climate change, and they will they will realize that within those movements they are being treated differently as women, which of course is an experience that has a long history. That's what happened to Amer many American women um, during the civil rights era. That you know they would be fighting for other people's causes um, passionately, and then realizing they're making tea for the men who are making the speeches. So I think there are certain patterns, but the, but it depends on the location. And then I'm 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 always mindful of the dirty socks story. I think it's it's useful to know that a lot of it is just minimal. It's it's you know small everyday experiences that radicalize women and make them rethink their whole upbringing, uh, social and emotional makeup. Um, you were asking about the goal of feminist teaching. Huh. I'm, um, I guess I teach feminism in different ways. Um, when I teach it at the university, I try to keep a distance and to remember that I'm a cultural s studies person in a cultural studies department. And that while I occasionally teach feminism as a methodology, for instance, in film studies, I teach course, courses on film with feminist film theory as the methodology. Mm, I, I primarily teach about feminism. In other words, I, I treat it as part of the history of the country about which I'm teaching, which happens to be the United States. Uh, I teach about the interconnection between uh, feminism as a social movement and a theory and um, various other theories and historical developments. Sometimes I, I teach about feminism as a player in uh, struggles. I'm teaching a, a cultural wars class today, um, uh, this semester, and, and feminism is actually paired with anti-feminism. But what inevitably happens, because I'm a publicly known person in Poland, and I also write activist essays, is that my students, you know, push me further. They, they, they ask me, well, but what do you really think about Phyllis Schlafly? And so, you know, you can't always resist the temptation to express your views. And I also believe that positionalities matter. So, so I teach about feminism rather than teach feminism. And that might be a weakness, um, but that that's how I operate. And I, I, 
And I discover year after year that by being taught about feminism and being given the liberty to distance themselves or not, and also to to explore different versions of feminism or different um, trajectories, um, many students, not exclusively female, um, are radicalized and re-examine their own lives. But um, uh, but in in my case, um, this radicalization tends to happen as a side effect of an intellectual encounter. So um, you know, I'm I guess I'm 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 just a you know well trained academic, and I I. And I try to keep my activist shoes in a separate cupboard. Um, but then there is, but there is that other activist cupboard. And I, I, I do occasionally um, speak to activist audiences, and then it's a whole different matter. Um, I try to make them self-conscious about a tradition of which they're already a part. I try to make them aware of internal disputes within feminism, but you know it's it's a it's a different tone, it's a different game when I'm um, when I'm talking to fellow activists, and I've also been a part of those debates. Like you know, I've changed my position on uh, on pornography and sex work over the last twenty years, and that was under the influence of many mm, teaching moments and learning moments. It's a I, I I think of feminism as an intellectual adventure, basically, which. And and how how people engage with it uh, and how um, how personal they get about it it depends on both on the person and the political moment. I, no, that's really interesting. Um, I especially um found that part very intriguing where you mentioned that you don't teach uh, feminism, you teach about feminism. I think that also creates that space for people to sort of understand their own feminisms. Um, I also want to share quickly the poll results. So all the participants here do agree that multiple feminisms can coexist. Um, I also want to reflect, Agniashka, on the first part you mentioned about the dirty socks bit. Um, if it's okay, I'll share a bit of a personal incident. Not a dirty socks thing, because fortunately, my brother is as much of a feminist as I am. But my mother told me this when I was eight years old. When I was born, um, my entire family, and I come from a big Indian family, they were expecting a boy. So the hospital room was full, like everyone was waiting. The moment they got to know, they waited for hours, right? They waited through labor, etc. And the moment they got to know it's a girl, everyone left, except for my father, everyone. Uh, my father didn't care. He said, you know, I have a child and I'm happy. And like my parents and my brother have been very strongly feminist, perhaps without knowing the language of it, which also really resonated with me when you shared about everyday experiences that shape feminism. Like my mother would never say she's a feminist. And I definitely belong to that second category where when you say you're feminist, you're not marriageable, you're crazy. Um, you're sort of outlawed from certain sections of society. But there is also that adoption of certain principles of feminism in people in my life who may not adopt the label. So um, everything that you shared was really strongly resonating with me. So thank you for sharing that. And we have a bunch of questions for you in chat, but I want to ask you one before I get to them. You mentioned um, when you were sharing a lot about how feminism is about power, right? And how a lot of the different feminisms have been about questioning power relations, have been looking at the intersection between politics, power, academia, um, even looking at how it's been shaped historically. So question then is, why is it important to teach about gender and sexuality in the context of power relations? And also, do you think there has been a shift in the understanding of gender that has bent it towards depoliticization? Yeah, that's something I've been thinking about a lot um, and trying not to judge, trying to be an observer. Um, first, I've, I've actually reconsidered my earlier answer. Um, I don't just teach about feminism. I teach as a feminist. I always put my cards on the table and most people know anyway. Um, and I guess what that means is that I take women's, uh, women's intellectual lives very seriously. Um, uh, I, um, I, I teach essays from the seventies, Adrian Rich, for instance, has a number of essays, but also Virginia Woolf has been really important to me. There, there is that, you know, um, First wave, second wave insight that um, that I that shaped me tremendously, which is that women are encouraged to give up on their intellectual lives in order to have reproductive lives and emotional lives, and I won't have that. 
I've I've actually antagonized students by telling them that I will not take excuses for not you know for for missing deadlines uh, when they tell me that you know they had to prepare a huge dinner for their husband. I mean, if it's a baby, then I've learned that, you know, care work has a different position, and I, I do allow for that. But, but, but I'm extremely uh, cautious to about students, uh, female students. This happens a lot in Poland, um, allowing themselves to be lazy. And I'm I'm sorry to be using that stigmatizing term, but just you know, dropping things because they are really in it for you know, they they think of themselves as future wives and mothers. And and so that is a value. I think that you know, taking your life seriously as an intellectual is a, is part of the fe feminist ethos. And I teach about it, but I also teach it. Um, gender, sexuality, power. Uh, to me, the way I was educated in feminist theory, that's absolutely central. In other words, the the term gender, as it developed in gender studies in um, starting the seventies, and then when it became became institutionalized as gender studies rather than women's studies, is about the is about um, gender imbalance. In other words, you would uh, the experience that you were uh, relating, which, by the way, is heartbreaking, and I've heard stories like this also from my, uh, you know, from my life, including from mothers and including from daughters who who realized that they were expected to be a boy. That is the ultimate gendered experience. In other words, you realize that your value as a human being is measured by a cultural standard in which men's lives are worth more than women's lives. And, you know, female infanticide is the extreme version of that. But, you know, the socks bit, it's also a realization of that of that type, right? In other words, your, your brother is someone who deserves to have his socks picked up. And your destiny in life is to pick up the socks of men. And you can extrapolate from that by, I don't know, reading the second shift by Arlie Hochschild or, uh, you know, reading about um, which, uh, which trials. It's, you know, it's all over the place. Gender is about the, the, the lesser value of women in patriarchal cultures. So what happens to this category in recent years, and some feminists are troubled by it, some are fascinated by it, is that gender becomes synonymous for the social construction of identity for the free choice of pronouns. In other words, um, and I, you know, I realized that the pronouns thing is all about um, making a gesture towards people whose pronouns do not correspond to their, um, you know, to their self-presentation or to their presumed biological endowment. And I, you know, I do it when I'm asked to do it. But there's something inside me, and it may be my training in the 80s and 90s, that says, well, actually, we don't get to choose our pronouns. And that's the problem. In other words, there to me, there is something um, uh, disturbing about my students' uh, um, certainty that gender is about freedom. Because to me, gender is a regime. Right, it's actually that uh, mm, that whole system of uh, of symbols, uh, uh, renumerations, um, the way we are interpolated as subjects in early childhood that that tells um, you know females that they're worth worth less than males, and also tells males who have a feminine gender expression that they're worth less. In other words. Anything that's that's associated with femininity in patriarchal culture is immediately downgraded. It is about power, and that has a symbolic, economic, intellectual dimension, and that's what the study of feminism is all about. So, I think there, that what we are witnessing right now in the loosening of gender norms in in Western societies, and let's face it, this is a Western, primarily a Western phenomenon, um, is is a huge change, and I'm very curious of where it will go, um, because uh, um, because there's tremendous backlash against it, and it might not last. On the other hand, because the backlash is so obsessed with gender. Um, I'm I'm willing to allow that this is where the revolution is today, that it's not about telling stories about so about socks or unequal pay or I don't know mm, menstrual the need for menstrual leave, which I understand in some countries is being introduced right now. In other words, those uh, changes that for equality that actually assume mm, that biology is. Um, 
is is you know where the action is and uh, and that the revolution might be in um non-binary um self-definitions but it's a but it is a shift it is and it is a shift within feminism and because that shift is so fast and so sweeping um i think uh, um, the that break that you were asking about earlier uh the the so-called turf wars are are such as you know so antagonistic so strong because it is a, it is a real change in feminism i don't think we can pretend that the word gender means what it meant in gender studies 20 years ago thank you for that um there are a couple of questions in chat and i'm going to pick that up for now uh one i would definitely want to know more on when you say gender is a regime if you could expand upon that but also another question in relation to that i'm just going to pick it up yeah um, is that when you're speaking, you're speaking of men and women, and why is it that you're not speaking of trans and non-binary folks, is a question from a participant. Uh, the answer to the second question is because I'm um, old-fashioned and a little tired from teaching. I guess I would say that if I thought about it, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to, to add. Uh, but... Um, as far as the gender regime con is concerned, uh, the way the term functioned until recently was to talk about societal norms, expectations, uh, and hierarchies. In other words, the gender regime is that which tells women that they must shave their legs and armpits, and which says that non-binary people are non-existent. Uh, in other words, you must choose your gender. We live, um, although maybe that's not true about you, Vandita, because India is is actually has a very interesting um, uh, variation, and and it goes way back in history for people who are in between or who refuse to be either. But in in Western societies, the gender regime is obsessively binary. Um, it's also obsessed with women's uh, softness and men's toughness, which results in a very particular um, set of rules for emotional self-expression or lack thereof. I mean, these are all Th these are all banalities, right? The idea that uh, you know that men shouldn't um, uh, shouldn't cry. The idea that uh, that women are more sensitive or somehow predestined to take care of their children or to take care of people in general. If you are uh, if you were in gender studies in the nineties, studying gender was about studying the oppressiveness of those rules. If you are in gender studies today. Uh, doing gender studies is at least to some extent about studying the variation in self-definitions that are available to people. In other words, the, the political act today, which I've, I'm sorry I failed to, um, to engage in, is to always add cisgendered when you're talking about people whose gender and biological, whatever, match, and to always add trans and non-binary when you're mentioning men and women. Mm, it's a new game. And, you know, it's a game I'm willing to play to a certain extent, but I'm also interested in historicizing this game. In other words, to, to seeing that that's not what feminism was 10 or 20 years ago. And by noting that historicity, I'm not saying that you know, in the in 1969, which is my favorite period in feminist history, by the way, it's extremely exciting and and funny and colorful. That they were all transphobes. Um, well, no, they weren't transphobes. Just that the trans question wasn't the core question at the time. The the core questions were, you know, rape, orgasms, um, violence against women. Uh, it you know, feminism has a history. And the the emergence of the um, of gender as self identity is is part of that history. That's how I see it. But I can understand why a certain cohort of women who are committed to that earlier definition would say that this is uh, that this is a misunderstanding at best or a betrayal at worst. And that's where the turf wars are about about the rejection of that shift within feminism. Thank you for that. Um, I will wait in case participants have follow-up questions. Um, so if you do, please leave them in chat and I will get to them in a bit. 
I do also want to understand, and I'm going to pick up a question from a participant. There are questions on like the North-South divide in gender, right? I think you also mentioned how, say in a country like mine, um, the understanding of gender historically has been very different. And there is a colonial impact of how gender then shaped uh, and shifted over the last say two or three centuries. So I'd love to understand, and there's a, this is a question from Anne Chris, is what relations do you see between the globalization of feminism, so to say, and post-colonial discourses on feminism? Okay, the, the history of feminism includes a moment uh, at the end of the 19th century when most uh, feminist movements in Europe, but also I think in, that would be include including Australia and the United States, were actually pretty racist and colonial. And one of the 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 and, and nationalist. In other words, the, the 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 primary argument of the suffragettes working at the time was that uh, women need to be given the right to vote so as to prevent um, the, the race mixing, for instance. That was an argument which which is completely unthinkable even 20 years later, but it was there. So I think feminism has a very troubled um, history with uh, of, of collusion with colonialism and racism. And that history has been examined. Um, it has made some progressive women anti-feminist. In other words, there, there is that argument around that actually feminism is mm, uh, inevitably um, Western or racist and colonial. And some of this argumentation has actually been taken up by the global right in a strange twist. Um, and that's something that I've been studying uh, in in our book, w um, the anti-gender politics in the populist moment, um, we show, we demonstrate how uh, the global right, um, you know, including the Catholic Church, religious fundamentalists in the United States, but also in Brazil, various groups that we identify, have persistently used the argument that gender is a form of colonization. I, I would be very curious, by the way, to hear if people have heard this argument in their various locations. It's out there. It's an argument that the right, uh, the anti-feminist right has been using. And the feminist movement is very um, in a very difficult position responding to it because it it's clearly not true that that gender equality is a colonial imposition. In fact, gender inequality and the binary gender system was the colonial imposition in a lot of contexts. But it's also true that uh, the United Nations, um, uh, around, you know, in the, around the mid, mid 80s, and then going strong in, into the 90s, used the language of global human rights, which I actually I find it extremely useful. I've used it myself as a feminist, but it is a language um, which takes for granted the hegemonic position of Western feminism. And that is a problem. And the right has been um, uh, taking advantage of that uh, of that problem. So I don't, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I would say that as with many other questions, it's complicated. And sometimes as an activist, I'm uh, I'm tempted to um, ignore that complication and just say it's, you know, the answer is simple. Feminism is good and anti-feminism is bad. But actually, feminism, bad things have been done in the name of feminism. And and we need to reckon with that. Right. No, um, I think especially the part and like, I think there is a tendency, at least in my context, to blame everything on colonization. Um, especially when you don't like it. And there isn't an understanding sometimes of things that have gone wrong internally or unequal power systems that have existed within the country as well before colonization happened. I'll give you a small example. Um, so I'm studying in the UK currently. And in the UK, I have a lot of um, fellow Indians in my class. This is the first time we face discrimination because of race, etc. And it really makes me think about who are we? Like, who are the students here? Because we often come from oppressor caste communities. Because back in our countries, we've never faced discrimination because we're perhaps the ones doing the oppression. And that is not a result of colonization. Um, that existed before colonization came in and exists even today. 
Um, and also the part about how gender binary is perhaps a construct that's been imposed on us, um, at least in my country in certain contexts. So thank you for sharing that. There's another question by Jen Cruz um, in line with this. They would love to understand where you think Europe stands, politically speaking, in terms of feminisms. Like, do you think there are countries that are leading the conversation here? Um, do you think there is a political bent in Europe in terms of feminist views? Was that uh, was Europe part of that question? Uh, what yes. what countries are leading in Europe? Yes, um, I'm an Americanist, so perhaps I'm not the best person to ask that question. I mostly read debates happening in the U.S. Um, and recently, I think there has been an upsurge in feminist writing in Eastern Europe, which is very interesting to me as a scholar. So, you know, I don't follow all the debates. You know, French feminism of the 60s and, and 70s and 80s is, is, is canonical, right? I mean, you cannot really do feminist history and feminist theory without reading Hélène Sixou or Lucie Rigaret and so on. And now there's um, uh, Paul Preciado, who is uh, Spanish, but writes in French and, you know, and, and, and he formerly, she is a crucial voice of, I don't know if it's European or global feminism. So I'm, I don't know. I think it, you know, in terms, I, I, it would be easier for me to speak in terms of activism. You know, where is the action? And I would say Spain and Italy and Poland are on my radar screen. It's where the largest feminist uh, um, uprisings have happened in recent years in response to powerful uh, misogynistic movements. Um, but I would, you know, I would really gladly hear about important writing coming out of whatever country. I'm heavily influenced by British feminism, I can say, because uh, I was, I, uh, um, I needed a count to counterbalance American feminism, which tends to be very individualistic. And when it talks about diversity or economic inequality, and it, it almost immediately starts talking about race, which is, which is a crucial topic. And I see there is a question about it, but it's not the same as, as socialist feminism. So when I became aware of Sheila Rowbotham and then later, I think Nancy Fraser is British by birth, I'm not sure. Um, then that, that was a game changer for me. Um, so psychoanalytic feminism coming from France was, uh, was, was crucial for me in my education. And of course, Simone de Beauvoir, but then the socialist feminists um, uh, fr from, from Britain. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not very well versed in German feminism, for instance, and there, I'm sure there, I'm, I'm missing something. Mm. I can see there's a question about, about racism yeah, in um, feminism maybe. and about black feminist thought. And I would like to address that because it's actually... Wait, can I just bring that question mm -hmm. up so it can be translated? Sure. I'll just read it out. Yes. So the question is, how are you teaching about racism in feminism and about black feminist thought and feminists of color? Which narratives about the women's movement in the USA do you use to get everybody in the picture? Yeah, mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that African American feminists are about a third of my syllabus. Um, and I'm actually, uh, I've been um, called out on not having enough uh, indigenous or, uh, or Asian feminists. And that's because I think of race as a, a absolutely central issue of American cultural history. And therefore that division with that, within feminism uh, and those, those conflicts are absolutely central to, to, to my understanding. Well, I, I teach it by, by making my students read for Sojourner Truth and Ida B. Wells and, and other women of that generation. And then Angela Davis, um, the Combahee River Statement, Fran Beale, and then later, obviously, uh, the um, intersectionality theory and some of the recent voices. Mm, but I also teach um, about tropes. In other words, I look at how um, and this is a discovery of Black feminists. Uh, Patricia Collins, perhaps, is a crucial name here. In other words, I, 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 I ask my students to look at American culture through an African-American feminist lens. We watch movies from the 50s or 60s, and, and I ask them, I push them to notice that almost every movie from that era contains a scene in which a nanny... Um, a black woman speaks with an artificially um, high voice, 
and says something extremely silly and then disappears. And so we, we want, well, what is this? What 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 is this need to bring in the deviant black female face, but then also bring her out of the picture? Who are these women, black women in Mae West movies? Who is the nanny? What is, what is, what is the function that she plays? And, uh, and some, I've, I've actually supervised several theses on these images, on what uh, Patricia Collins calls the controlling images, uh, nanny, the, the Jezebel, um, uh, the, extremely images that are both sexist and racist at the same time. And there, of course, exist also on the male side, uh, gendered images such as um, the black brute uh, or Sambo. And so we talk a lot about, not just about black feminism or about um, uh, inevitably racism in white mainstream feminism, especially of the 70s, um, but we also talk about the insights of uh, black feminists, which I think ironically became the central insights of gender studies in ensuing years. In other words, we're not, I don't, I don't in, include black feminists as a minority within a, you know, kind of salad bowl, but it's actually the authors of what eventually became the, the core insight of gender studies, of intersectionality theory. Um, uh, it, it's a perspective more than a phenomenon, I would say. Um, Angela Davis is a key uh, is a key text. I, I usually and bell hooks to some extent, but I I really like the the that early book by Angela Davis, and which has also been translated into Polish. Um, but my students tend to really like bell hooks, um, so I, I follow them uh, there as well. And we also read a lot of Audre Lorde, partly because I I um, you know I'm, I'm trained in literature and I find Lorde to just be a genius of the English language and. Some of the some of those insights uh, that I've been mentioning, she just writes them in these incredible poetic, moving ways, also autobiographically. So I would say that that black yeah, I've never taught a course exclusively on black feminism, but I've been accused of mm, having too much black feminism in my in my courses. Um, yeah, there, I guess like, there's one more reflection that I would like to share um, is that uh, black feminism is more relatable than mainstream white feminism when you are teaching outside the United States. In other words, you know, in a post-socialist country, when when you're talking to groups of people who are raised by working mothers, who are routinely accused of being too strong, to being ball breakers, too responsible, you know, you give them Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique to read, which we have to because it's a classic and it's fun in its own way. And they're like, this is exotic. This is strange. What do you mean housewife? They've never met one. Like Polish women work. It's a poor country. On the other hand, when they read uh, Michelle Wallace's um, essay on uh, the black matriarch, where she talks about how black women in the United States work extremely hard and are constantly accused of, um, you know, being too strong and, and you know, and, and, a threat to their men's masculinity. Oh, they, they say, that's my story. That's my mom. That's my grandmother. So there is a strange, um, th there, there is a relatability. And I find a lot of students want to write about Black feminism for that reason. Okay, thank you. Um, I personally also, I feel like whenever I've read anything coming from Black feminist authors, I find that there is an intrinsic, and do correct me if I'm wrong, there is an intrinsic material analysis to their feminism um, that really reaches out to someone like me because it is representative of my life and it is representative of the struggles I face. Perhaps even what you mentioned around a lot of it being autobiographical when it started out um, could perhaps play a role in that to make it more relatable to people. Yes, but of course, American feminism in general um, is heavy on autobiographical tropes. In other words, reading feminism is reading women tell the stories of, you know, how they awakened. But you're right, when you're reading uh, women, minor women from my ethnic minorities or working class women, that some, that's a whole other white, so-called white trash women um, uh, who, uh, who examine their class position and the masculinities in white working class. Th there is a context uh, or materialist component, which I think makes a lot of sense, mm, including I think to contemporary middle-class white 
people in the States. In other words, you know, those days of the 70s when, you know, everybody was more or less well off and, you know, your therapist was your main problem that that's exotic that's gone those days of prosperity and uh pure culture wars are gone so yeah mm -hmm. and but but also the, the fact that gender in it on its own doesn't really do do much for us anymore we need an intersectional analysis so you know gloria steinem is a cultural document on the other hand the combahee river collective statement actually there is a kind of realness about it that that my students discuss yeah no i really appreciate that i think for me the river collective statement also speaks to failure and i feel like that reflection on failure and that reflection on this mm -hmm. is who we are and this is how we show up is very important mm -hmm. um, there are a bunch of questions um so i'm going to pick one of them up that's related to this so one of the participants commented that there are good practices of movements coming together um, say trans and queer activism movements coming together with more mainstream women's rights movement. Um, and there's a related question that I'd love for you to answer. Is that are there principles that bind us together as feminists? Is this something you bring into your teaching or even in your personal practice, if you'd like to answer? Hmm. Principles that bind us together as feminists. Um, you know, we used to talk about sisterhood as an ethos, uh, you know, always putting your, uh, your, your sisters in battle first. But I think that, you know, enough um, critique of, um, of sisterhood has, has been produced in, in the last decades to make me skeptical of that. Um, it's it's hard to put into words. I mean, I think it's a movement that uh, that that valorizes um, uh, solidarity with including solidarity across um, uh, class lines. Polish feminism has a slogan: "You will never walk alone," which I think was also it has a history somewhere in in sports, but I know it was around a lot in the Black Lives Matter movement. This idea that you do not abandon people, that there that we are a community and not a group of um, liberated individuals. So, and then egalitarianism. I've I I. I come from a fairly hierarchical society in which um, academics speak to each other using um, um, uh, terms like professor, professor, doctor, you know, always marking hierarchy. We don't do that in feminist circles. We're all on first name basis. And I think there is a, there's a conscious effort at egalitarianism. Um, and, you know, we like to think the, the, of the feminist groups, including research groups, as friendship groups, but they're, they're not always that. And I think there, you know, there's an, also an ongoing conversation about um, woman to woman cruelty hierarchies and so on. Um, but I guess I'm too deeply incited to, to judge that ethos in comparison to say, you know, the ethos of people doing anthropology or the ethos of people engaged in other forms of activism. Um, but yeah, being careful about, you know, how you treat other people is a, is a big part of it. And, and, and the word care in the last year, years has, has joined the discussion more than the idea of individual freedom or individual, um, you know, competitiveness. And of course, in Poland, the word solidarity has a special meaning to it, which feminism um, tries to draw on. I've, I've written about the way that we draw on earlier traditions of activism in ethos and in symbolism. Right. No, I mean, I know you didn't give principles, but I still heard a few. Um, I think especially those around egalitarianism. And I think a little bit even around how sometimes solidarity, solidarity can be meaningless in words if it's not followed up with action and how that can perhaps be a gap in a lot of our context. Like I find that in the Indian context, the places I work in where solidarity is now sometimes used as a language or a brand, um, as a way to like further discourse, as a way to gain popular traction, but it isn't followed up with action uh, because action requires work and action also requires sitting with discomfort and sometimes navigating through that discomfort. So I'm going to ask you um, one of the questions that comes up from, uh, from reading your book, Who is Afraid of Gender? Uh, 
Um, you speak about how we might be able to reach more people by speaking of everyday experiences than by speaking of human rights, which can sometimes be really abstract, right? Um, and I also heard that a little bit in the examples you were sharing. Um, even in our one-on-one -on -one conversation, I remember you mentioning that theory can sometimes be intimidating and it can also be a gatekeeping factor for a lot of people to participate in movement work. So then in keeping with that, um, do you think populist feminism can help us understand and strengthen local feminist resistance? Um, our book is, is an analysis of movements that are in existence. In other words, we're not giving advice. We are describing what's actually going on. And I think um, the name populist feminism has been contested. Some people say that it actually sounds like a, a so we could, re, I, for, for the purpose of this conversation, I could replace it with popular feminism that, you know, the feminism of new menos of the black, um, the black protests in Poland of the women's March on Washington in the States of, you know, the, the, the this was not happening 10 years ago. It coincides with the rise of right-wing populism. And it's a stage in, uh, in feminist history, some, some scholars have referred to it as a fourth wave, um, which claims the, the idea of people, we the people, uh, for uh, feminists, for for women talking about women's rights, but but they're also talking about economic injustice. The you know the it's feminism for ninety nine percent, as um, discussed by by uh, in this famous manifesto of few few years ago, co-authored by um, Fraser among others. Um, it is also a movement that is not afraid of emotions. In other words, unlike the second wave, which was very often ironic, cryptic, the third wave, which was often high theoretical and um, many women found it inaccessible, its discourses. The fourth wave speaks in, in, in powerful phrases. It talks about pain. It talks about life and death. It talks about survival. It talks about, in Poland, we, we actually analyzed the slogans that accompanied the wave of protests. It talks about the other side, patriarchy being about torture and cruelty. In other words, feminism has in recent years claimed the language of everyday experience, but also the language of values, the language of moral outrage. And I find it fascinating and empowering. And I watch my students, you know, become feminists, not by reading Virginia Woolf, but by reading the most recent, you know, newspaper and finding out that their lives are in danger because religious fundamentalists are uh, planning to take what remains of our reproductive rights away. So there is a kind of fury about it. It's a lot like the 60s, actually, in that way, that, you know, feminism becomes a mass movement overnight. And I mean that literally. In Poland, when mm, the complete ban on abortion was proposed in, nine, uh, in 2016, the Facebook group that was started by three women uh, overnight became a group of 60,000. And then the next day, there were there were massive demonstrations. So yeah, everyday experience, uh, emotionality, um, uh, and building bridges and bringing co building coalitions very fast. And they they they're also fragile because they were built so fast. Uh, but it is a real social movement. It's it's not a it's not an academic and it's not just a field of an academic inquiry, which of course makes my teaching very different. When I started teaching feminism in the late 90s, I was teaching something abstract, mysterious, exciting, something that had potential but was just really odd. And uh, two years ago, when I started my class on faces of feminism, uh, most of my students were wearing buttons that they had, you know, that that they used w during street demonstrations because it was it was at the height of the the the, the black protests. So very different context. Thank you for that. I think even in India and in other contexts that I've worked in, for feminism to become popular, it has to become a lot more relatable to each person's experience. I remember um, even the Argentinian one, that you, the example you mentioned, I think what I found so powerful about that was it changed the narrative to talk about the right to life and the right to life of the person bearing the child. And it started with a small green like scarf and a small slogan and it took over. So thank you for that. Um, there are a bunch of related questions I'd have for you in terms of 
what does popularism um, then lead to in terms of backlash, right? But before I ask you that, um, I'm going to ask our participants. There's a Mentimeter link in chat. We'd love to understand from you some backlash against feminist movements that you have seen in your context. This could be your country, where you live, um, whatever context you want to share. And maybe we'll take a minute to let everyone answer this. So the backlash question is that what we're talking yeah. about. Um, do we want to maybe wait for some participant responses? I'm just mindful that, you know. Oh, you're, you're, you're at, I'm sorry. I lost, I, I was lost <laughs> in the depths of Zoom. Uh, yeah. We're hearing about backlash from other people. Yeah. Um, I'd love to hear from you as well, but I thought it'd be nice to get some responses sure. from the participants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what we're diagnosing in our book is a global wave of backlash, which we uh, refrain from calling backlash, actually. We think that the term, which comes, of course, from the famous book by Susan Faludi, might be misleading in that it's more than backlash. It's actually a huge offensive of a new kind of uh, often religiously motivated patriar uh, patriarchal ideology and power. And it's not, it likes to see itself and to present itself as a reaction against the supposed excesses of feminism. But it's actually quite self-sufficient. I mean, the, some of the, 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 the ideas that the global anti-gender movement has would take us back to, you know, to before women had the vote. Um, they, they, are, they are in the, they're contemplating outlawing divorce, complete bans on abortion, of course, um, uh, homophobic uh, laws that, you know, in the West, they might be about reversal of um, uh, gay marriage, but in, in places like Russia, it's about, you know, persecution and, and putting people in prison. So I think it's, it's worse than backlash, what we're talking about. We're talking about a wave of what in some places can be called right-wing populism that's obsessed with gender and in some places you can I think safely call it fascism mm, and so backlash is too weak a word I would say right no I know that um, I think the backlash has some very severe consequences in undermining rights I'll also share my screen and perhaps you have any reflections on what's being shared so some of the backlash that people are saying that they have seen is um you know, an increase in cancel culture, um, the idea that women have and ask for too many rights nowadays, um, that feminism is overshadowing real problems, right? Like global warming or money problems, not understanding that there's a correlation. Um, it, they give an example how in France, inclusive language has been politicized um, and translators and copywriters may lose work because of their feminist position. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, in Germany, there's a strong opposition to feminist development policy, yeah, there are a bunch of answers coming in. Um, I'm wondering if you have um, any thoughts on any of this. Yes, I think that gender issues, uh, meaning gay rights, trans rights, the new wave of gender identities, but also reproductive rights, uh, violence against women, that these issues are um, at the center of the new culture wars and that s some some scholars have argued that what we are viewing is a resurgence of um uh, masculinity which is resentful about the you know the changes that took place over the last few decades and that it's a it's a real effort to reinstate a gender regime you know that Maybe we, we shouldn't be thinking in terms of uh, his, uh, progressive historical trajectories. We don't know if they would want us to go back to the 50s or maybe the 1820s. But certainly the, the project is to, um, to, to naturalize men and women as uh, completely binary categories, nothing in between, and uh, to relegate women to, to reproductive um, functions and to give to empower men in what is considered natural masculinity. And I'm, I'm saying this based on a lot of reading of um, um, uh, alt-right uh, positions on gender. I, I, I wrote a paper on the new masculinities, listening to many Jordan Peterson videos and so on. There, it's the, the, the culture of new masculinism is really out there. Um, 
but it's, it's one of the one of the the, uh, the contributors mentioned uh, cancel culture. I'll be I would be very curious of what is meant by that so-called radical feminist being engaged in cult, cancel culture. These are both very contested terms, and not knowing where the person is coming from, I have no idea what it means actually. Okay, so I um, actually can't tell who has added what answer. So uh -huh. if the person who's added it would like to share. If they would like to explain, I would be very interested in that. Yeah, because of course, you know, there are feminists who call themselves radical feminists um, and are actually considered anti-feminist by others. Um, and I'm talking about uh, the the, the so-called gender critical feminism. Um, on the other hand, the concept of cancel culture is extremely contested also because some, some feminists would tell you it doesn't exist at all. It's just part of the right wing language. But some would say that, you know, that actually it does exist. It's, you know, it's a very complex scene. And I think the Internet and social media have been a game changer. Um, and one thing that that feminism has to face um, is that we are not quite as good at social media as uh, the alt-right trolls, the Russian trolls, the misogynists. And, you know, I don't know if it's a, if, if, if it's a gendered phenomenon, if you could, you know, some people would just say, of course, women don't spend so much time online as men do, or if it's about progressive movements not being so well versed in hate speech and trolling and uh, it's 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 a huge problem 20 years ago it seemed like the internet would be this um, place where equality and free debate rules but i think we now know that's not the case the internet is what made trump the president of the united states and and so on definitely thanks for that i was just um, i attend i was going to attend an event that looked at how anti gender movements have taken over the digital space and mm -hmm. how they're so insidious in being able to reach a population that a lot of feminist groups just can't, right? Uh, because mm -hmm. of access to resources, technical know-how, et cetera. And also the very construction of digital spaces is designed to enable that sort of division. And it's designed to enable that sort of um, political and social thinking silos. And it gets worse and worse. Um, so a lot of, at least in my experience, a lot of conversations that I would have perhaps had with someone over coffee or in a classroom um, now are no longer conversations because they happen behind screens and it's easier to become a part of what you call echo chambers and then only exist in that. Thank you for that. So we have a lot of questions for you um, and we have about 20 more minutes. So I'm going to hold on to my questions. I will keep one for later and maybe ask you a couple of questions from the ones that have come in. Um, I think you mentioned at a point that your students love bell hooks and that's why you do uh, defer to it and you do uh, teach more of it. Just going to, there is a question on bell hooks for you. Is It's from Eriada. Um, I, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. It's what about bell hooks idea of activism in the classroom? Um, what is, does that resonate with you? What do you think of it? Um, and also thinking of teaching and learning as activism mm -hmm. itself. I'm ambivalent about it. Um, uh, it it may be a question of being uh, trained in a fairly conservative academic environment, um, but I I I think in Poland it just there there's something about being obviously and um, bringing your politics into the classroom in this completely obvious manner that that makes that disqualifies you as an academic. And I'm in a way I'm getting the, you know, the bad end of both uh, sides of this debate because I'm accused of not being activist enough um, by people who assume that bell hooks is the guy, you know, is the guidelines that can can be uh, applied everywhere. Um, and I think it's contextual. I think she is speaking from a very American situation. American campuses have been very political for a very long time in ways that they aren't in other locations. But I also get accused of my fellow academics of being too political. So my solution to that problem in recent years has been increasingly to teach conflict. To, to I'm, I teach courses on the culture wars, on the dynamics of polarization and so on. But I believe that a certain amount of maybe even pretended neutrality gives students, you know, elbow room. 
I don't expect my students to all be left-wing and feminist. I welcome conservatives in my classrooms. I think academia is about thinking and not about um, being forced to make commitments. So in that way, I am old-fashioned. Thank you for that. Um, there's a follow-up uh, related question by Sehribang Imra. Um, and their question is related to the dichotomy you shared around being an activist and an academician, right? So the question is, are you able to draw a line between activism and academia? And are we to in infer from what you've shared that academics who do their academic work from an activist perspective are not well-trained? So what is the line between activism and academia? And can we assume that there is a neat separation? I remember when you and I spoke, you said this one line that stayed with me, where you said that academia is the archive of the feminist movement. And if that's not the case, then it's not like, it's not useful. So do you want to expand on that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's actually something I, I, I heard in a feminist class many years ago and it stuck with me. And it was, the statement was made by, a, by, by one of the founders of women's studies in Britain. And um, it st struck me because at the time, this was late 90s, there was a lot of feminist theory that was completely detached from any activist base. But that was the case in Western European and Western contexts in general. In a country like Poland, to teach a course with feminism in its title or to start a women's studies um, uh, course was, was in itself a fairly radical thing to do. In other words, to loosen up the walls of academia. So inevitably, these things are interconnected. Um, but I also think that, you know, that there is such a thing as methodology and intellectual traditions that we study, which are which have their place in academia. And once I'm in the street or making signs, you know, I don't make footnotes in my signs. Um, there, there is a way in which I have to abandon the complexities of feminist theory when I'm out there uh, defending women's rights to right to choose. And I've caught myself thinking, oh, my gosh, this is a sign that I'm, you know, this sign that I'm making. I could teach a class about its history. But of course, the sign works because it works, not because I know the history. Right. But it is complicated and it's very difficult to keep apart. And we, we make jokes about, you know, we're in the business when you get to be the bird in the morning and the anthropologist and the, and the ornithologist in the afternoon. And, you know. So to some extent, it's a pretense that we're keeping the, it apart. I think the, the the asker of the question had that in mind. And it's it's true. But I think it's also a useful pretense. And you you know, it's complicated. Yeah. So agreeing uh, with that complicated aspect for sure, um, there's a question from Pia, um, which does talk about like this, you know how you said you can't add a footnote to your sign and how there are complexities which sometimes don't um, translate as well. So I'm thinking even about the feminist discussions around reproductive rights in Poland. Um, was ableism a part of those conversations? Was disability justice a part of those conversations? It, I would say that to some extent it was a blind spot. And actually, I have a colleague in my institute um, who who examined that. In other words, um, that there was a, an unintended and unthought through cruelty in some of the feminist sloganeering around the right of women to choose abortion in cases of fetal uh, deformation. In some cases, the way people, women talked about it was actually potentially offensive or deeply hurtful to women who had disabled uh, children with disabilities or to women who had chosen to have children with Down syndrome. I think mm, that, and that, that's something that is worth thinking through. On the other hand, there is also a very powerful coalition in Poland between the women's movement and the movement for the rights of people who are taking care of human beings with disabilities, children, but but also grown up children. And, you know, the, it's it's a complex situation which has to do with the fact that mm, the, the these people are getting money from the state under the condition that they don't work, which puts them in a, in a, in a position of something that is routinely compared to slavery, right? You you can't, the, what, there's a famous 
writer um, uh, uh, who has written a book and couldn't claim the honorarium for the book because she would lose the money she's getting for her disabled child, that sort of thing. And so feminists have actually stood, uh, you know, have, have partaken and uh, partaken and, and co-organized um, demonstrations uh, in defense of people with disabilities. But but I think there is also a blind spot. There is a there is a the the, the idea that you should never be forced to give birth to a um, uh, to a malformed fetus. Is, is is an obvious ethical claim, but once you start talking about it, it can easily be turned into uh, mm, something that is disrespectful of people with disabilities. Right, thank you for that. Um, I know you mentioned a little bit about care, and there's another question. Sorry, there's so many, um, which is great. Um, I think the question is around what you think of uh, what do you think of the focus of putting care in the center of feminist studies, especially if analyzing and explaining um, current societal problems, such as the collapsing health and education system, climate crisis, or um, since you brought up the context of care when you were talking about um, disability rights, I was wondering if you want to share your thoughts on this. My Possibly most popular book um, published in 2014 is called Matka Feministka, Mother and Feminist. And um, it was very broadly discussed. I was accused by fellow feminists of having abandoned feminism, which I think some feminists in Poland um, associated with a kind of you know, career woman ethos, uh, individualism, um, and so on. And and I was also, um, you know, I was, I was engaged by conservatives who had assumed that the idea of motherhood or parenting and care is actually a conservative idea. So I, I was very much involved in those debates. Mm, and I absolutely share uh, the idea that that is out there now in a lot of countries. I've, I've been looking at books from Britain and, and the States. Mm, uh, that that care is the care crisis is a game changer for feminist history. Um, so yes, I just I, the answer is yes. I think it's absolutely central. Care is, I think, also that one place where you cannot divide between um, identity issues and economic issues. It's where they meet, right? It's by analyzing the 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 the, the situation of the global care um, um, circuit, right? The fact that. Polish women are taking care of the elderly in Germany while Ukrainians are taking care of their children, while poorer Ukrainians are taking care of their children and so on. That that whole situation that that by now has a lot of literature, right. migration, care, uh, care work, exploitation. It's not an issue. It's a heavily gendered issue, which is also about economic inequality and globalization. And it is one of the most serious issues out there. Absolutely. It's also what makes people who used to be conservative into feminists. I've, I've seen people become feminists by, by reading about that whole situation. Well, that does make a lot of sense. I think um, the crisis we're seeing around us is also because of the lack of acknowledgement of that work and seeing that as work. Um, looking at chat, there are a bunch of com comments on this has been an interesting session um, and they're really enjoying it. I also have one last question from for you from my end. And then if we have time, we can take a couple of others from the audience. I think um, having been both a student and a teacher myself, um, I have been very deeply influenced by teachers who sort of helped me live my feminist principles and also built my agency to take action. And I'd love to know from you, um, as an academic, um, as a teacher yourself, what is it that you want to give your students or the next generation of feminists, right? Like what kind of feminisms? I know you shared about building the agency of your students, so we'd love to hear more on that. Yes, I've had, you know, I've been a teacher for 25 years now, so it's been quite a while. I've established lasting relationships with former students. Elżbieta Korolczuk, who is my co-author now and colleague, uh, is also my former student, and I have several relationships like this. And I think, mm, and I, I had relationships like this with my female feminist uh, teachers. So there's a way of um, 
in which teaching becomes a form of empowerment. One thing that I engaged in that I can brag about a little bit is in an um, educational um, experiment um, uh, called um, Open University of Karol Modzelewski, named after a guy, but that wasn't my my choice, a very progressive, important guy, in which high school students, university students, and two professors, including me, um, well, we, we engaged in educational events in high schools and also online. And two of the high school students, uh, three of the high school students participating in it, um, asked me if I knew the email for Judith Butler. And I said, well, I actually, I do, but I don't know if she'll answer. They wrote to her, she responded, and we ended up with an interview with Judith Butler by three students, one girl and uh, two guys. And uh, you can find it online. I wonder if maybe um, Vandita can share the link. Um, it was uh, it was broadcast from my bedroom, and um, I think something like 30,000 people watched it. It was quite broadly um, shared, and it's wonderful. They're terrified of her, but they kind of warm up to Judith at some point, and and I think it was fun for her as well. And she actually explains her theory and her the changes in her thinking about gender in extremely relatable ways. Um, I think it's one of the best interviews with Judith Butler out there. So you know, I'm not on the screen, but I was behind the, uh, I, and I'm proud of that position. The fact that I, you know, I helped them phrase the email, I helped them schedule and broadcast and write the questions, and and I I know that it was a life changing experience for those kids. They're they they are now at the university. And I've, I've tried similar things with students. I've, I encourage students to, to do their own things, to publish their written work, uh, to translate and publish texts that they find fascinating. Um, you know, it's and it, it's, it all goes down to that um, Adrian Rich idea, you know, take your intellectual life seriously. Um, so, yeah, the, that kind of empowerment is something that I would like to be remembered for once I retire, which is not so soon, but already on the horizon. Thank you so much. We have shared that link in chat. Um, we'd love for participants to check it out. I think it's really beautiful and powerful to be able to empower and create that space for students to do this, um, especially when it can be really terrifying. But to know that your teacher like has your back uh, really helps. And to me, that's a little bit of, you know, you said you teach uh, about feminism. But I think this is also for me a demonstration of how feminism can be a way of teaching and the methodology of teaching uh, rather than just teaching about it. So I find that really empowering. And I see a comment in chat that says that is feminist leadership. Uh, so thank you so much for that. I am going to close now because we're, we have about five minutes more to go. This has been so great. We still have a lot of questions for you. So I'm perhaps going to send them across to you later. There, um, there is one final question, and only if it's not too personal and if you feel like answering it, is where do you position yourself as a feminist? And how do we all come together against the anti-gender movement? Um, only if you feel like answering that. How do I position myself? So, um, um, if you, you know, on the spectrum of um, various feminisms, um, I like the term radical feminist, but of course I associate that with the radical 60s and not with the so-called, uh, you know, anti-gender feminist today. But I, 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 I'm, in a way, I live my intellectual, much of my intellectual life in the late 60s. So I'm very invested in that, um, in those debates, in those, uh, those, those radical ideas. Um, I'm certainly an anti-nationalist and anti-racist feminist. I'm also Jewish. You introduced me as a Pole, but I'm Jewish. And one of my one of the, the ongoing issues in my life is about the intersection of anti-Semitism and anti-genderism. I've published my, my my most recent article is about this. I'll be happy to send it to anyone who wants it. Um, and I think it's my biggest discovery also is that there is a connection between anti-Semitic uh, movements and the attacks on gender. And so, so that's something I'm interested in. I'm also very much interested in Jewish feminism, both religious, secular, um, uh, Israeli, anti-Israeli. That's that's a debate that I'm I have a huge personal investment in. I've actually been to to Israel to talk to various Jewish feminists. And um, 
and it, it, you know it's part of it of being a second generation um a polish jew my my father is a holocaust survivor that this is a deeply personal and important issue to me thank you and thank you for sharing that with us um i can't imagine how difficult it's been but to see you build that across countries um to build that sort of solidarity is really powerful thank you um I am going to close now. Sorry, there are more questions coming to me in DM, but we're running out of time. Uh, but we will share these questions ahead. Um, thank you so much for being a part of this today, Agnieszka. I learned so much. And I, I just want to reaffirm what I said last time. I'd love to be in a classroom with you. Uh, so thank you. I've learned so much about how to teach and also what to teach and how to inspire critical thinking and reflexivity as a big part of what it means to be a feminist teacher. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you also to our participants. We've had so much engagement from y'all. Um, I will share a link to the PDF where you've shared your answers on the Padlet board. Mm -hmm. I want to share quickly about the next panel. Um, we have our final panel next Tuesday on the power of feminist writing with Minna Salami and Urvashi Butalia. Uh, please do join us if you're interested. And you can also leave your thoughts and reflections from today on the Padlet board. Agnieszka, are there any final thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Thank you for having me. And um, I left my email in case anyone wants to engage in a conversation or, uh, you know, ask for a PDF. I'll be happy to share um, syllabi, um, articles by myself or someone else. Um, and it, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for holding the series. Um, I participate. I, I was listening in on the earlier pa panel it was fascinating and I'm I'm coming again I think it's really important to have these conversations internationally and um, openly thank you very much thank you thank you for being here with us and I know it wasn't easy to be our sole panelist uh, but we're very very grateful to have you thank you um, everyone can drop off um, we will share some of the links on the Padlet board so you can keep an eye out over there thank you see you You're on mute um, in case you're speaking. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, it's It's been stressful, but really um, <laughs> exciting and fun. I hope that the audience liked it. So nope, loved it. Um, and I'm so sorry. I know that being alone meant a lot of questions kept coming at you, mm -hmm. uh, but you were fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.